and enterprise risk management is really a, a uh, formulation uh, that uh, seeks to um, aggregate all risks within the enterprise so that they can be seen in their full flowering, their additivity and their covariation, that you get a picture of the uh, risks that the enterprise uh, faces in its totality. And it, the origin of the idea is uh, the uh, uh, very, very uh, disturbing failures that we've encountered uh, going back uh, to Enron and uh, uh, WorldCom and, and HealthSouth and, and many of these, and, and then forward to, to the, you know, the uh, failures associated with the Great uh, Recession that began in 08. And uh, many of these failures were seen as, uh, um, in retrospect, as failures in risk management, failures of the directors, the boards of these firms, to fully appreciate the risks that they were taking. So uh, ERM is an effort to establish a process that uh, encourages uh, constant vigilance to the totality of risks undertaken by the enterprise. And um, it focuses most especially on uh, those risks that um, put the continuity of the firm into jeopardy. OK, so that's, that's the starting premise. That's the starting idea. And uh, it's, very, it's a very process-oriented idea. And that is that you want to build up uh, within the firm institutional uh, practices that uh, preclude any inclination to either ignore or deny risks that jeopardize either the strategic intent or the continuity of the organization. It's, it's a new idea in its conception. Risk management itself is something that firms have been doing piecemeal for a long, long time. But the notion of pulling these all together and placing responsibility at the board level for overseeing them in their totality, in a holistic way, that's new. That's new. It's new because uh, uh, it's been uh, uh, only formulated in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and uh, you, can, you can go into these very large organizations, most especially uh, financial institutions, and you will see that the practices vis-a-vis -vis risk management today are radically different from what they were 20 or 25 years ago. So that's a sense in which they're new. Um, and uh, uh, th these practices are prodded by law, by regulation, and by uh, uh, a recognition on the part of uh, management uh, that, that uh, there was a, a, uh, uh, an inclination to uh, ignore certain kinds of risks. Well, uh, they produce advantages uh, because uh, they, they uh, uh, foster a broader recognition of all of the hazards that the institution faces. And so uh, in, in, in fostering this recognition, you, you're, you're encouraged to take steps to manage these risks in a rational way. Uh, denial is not a rational response. Denial is an emotional response. Hmm? And so this is an attempt to uh, substitute a rational response for what was, in some instances at least, uh, an emotional response, one of denial. There were certain types of risks that uh, we as human beings tend to ignore. 
and these institutions did too. Uh, there are certain calamities that are so uh, odious that we just as soon deny their existence as face up to them. Well, denying their existence, we, we, we certainly can't take any steps to mitigate them. Well, um, uh, most of the costs of, of uh, mitigating risks or hazards involve the deployment of additional resources. Uh, the example in Fukushima Daiichi case would have been to uh, build the uh, um, uh, safety uh, mound, uh, the, the, the seawall, higher. Well, the higher you build it, the more materials you need, the more effort involved, the greater the cost. Uh, the higher the wall is, the less likely it'll be breached. And that's a good example. There are many, many examples that we, we might take. Depends. You pick a hazard, and I'll tell you what the operating uh, uh, response would be to, to that hazard. Um, and uh, it's usually... It's usually, um, uh, when it comes to enterprise risks, that is those risks that, that, that tend to be most threatening, the response is not to buy an additional derivative, you know, a financial solution. It's an operating solution, usually, and it means usually you have to have additional resources, thicker walls, uh, uh, deeper foundations, uh, extra workers, uh, additional inventory. These are all steps that will um, uh, reduce the likelihood of you facing a stoppage or, or, or a shock to your system that, that's paralytic. Well, I said extra workers, you know. Uh, 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 suppose I, I have a, a a production line, and to keep the produ production line going, I need 30 workers. Well, at any time, one worker can get sick or have to leave the line. How many workers should I have in reserve to protect the line from stopping? Okay, so that's, that's an example. If you have none, the risk is at a maximum, right? That's considered best practice according to e the ERM literature. And uh, in public companies, the ultimate responsibility for managing enterprise risk resides with the board of directors. But it doesn't end with the board of directors. It only resides there as um, uh, these people will supervise the management of risk. Then there will be people on the management team who will be responsible for risk. There will be committees. There will usually be communication channels set up so that new risks can, can be communicated up and down and across the organization. So uh, what you're doing is you're building an organization within the organization, one that's addressed to safety, you can call risk mitigation, risk control, hazard control, security. Uh, once you acknowledge the hazards, then you begin to think of uh, ways to control them. Core risks are those risks that the company uh, specializes in managing. Every company specializes in managing some kind of a core risk. If you take a uh, commercial bank, for example, its competency, its core competency, is in managing credit risk. So it's not doing anything in banking unless it's taking on credit risk. Credit risk is core to the business. And the bank wants to take on as much credit risk as it can safely take on. It doesn't want to eliminate all credit risk. It wants to take on credit risk, but it wants to do it in a disciplined way 
So you need a certain amount of financial capital and you need a certain amount of human capital to take on uh, uh, various levels of risk. So controlling that core risk is controlling the amount of capital you have and the amount of human capital, the amount of financial capital, the amount of human capital you have. Now with these core risks that you have a particular skill in managing, there are, there are associated these ancillary risks. Well, these ancillary, what are ancillary? Any risk that isn't core is ancillary. Ancillary risks you have no particular competency in managing, but they're unavoidable because they travel as attachments to the core risk, sort of. Now, you want to do all you can to get rid of those, okay? And that you do with, uh, with uh, f financial derivatives, and you do that with insurance. You do that by shifting these risks to other people very often. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, the recognition of the distinction between core and ancillary risks is key because every business has its core risks. If you take uh, uh, the Toyota um, uh, problems of a couple of years ago, you see what, what the core risk, core risk is not in building the automobile, core risk is in their reputation as a, as a, as a, as a provider of transportation services, their reliability, um, their accident uh, avoidance, these things. And, and um, uh, I don't think they acknowledged it. They didn't recognize this very uh, clearly. They had, to, they had to tear the company apart, basically, and put it back together again to, to fully acknowledge what their core risk was and, uh, or is. And, and, and they did. I think that they restored, they restored their position in the marketplace to a certain, certain extent. But that certainly was a traumatic experience for them. And what they discovered was that their core risk was associated to, to the, with the uh, reputation that they had for providing very high quality order, uh, transportation services. Hmm? That's yeah. Uh, but now, what would be an ancillary risk that they faced? Well, uh, the, the, the tsunami, <laughs> right? Uh, that was an, I mean, they're not in the business of protecting against tsunamis, right? Uh, so they want to take on more and more of their core risk. They, 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 they want to avoid as much as possible. Uh, now, this is always subject to the cost of avoidance. You know, you have to weigh the cost of avoidance uh, against the uh, c cost of a cat catastrophe, right? Well, uh, there's no mystery about this. What you would do is, is uh, either examine what best practices are in the industry, look around, and see what others are doing, make judgments. You can hire a consult. There are many consultants available uh, t uh, to help you uh, structure an ERM program. Practically all the large accounting firms do this. Uh, actuaries do this. They, they, they're, they're particularly adept. As a matter of fact, these are the two groups that, that that's sort of work in this space. Um, uh, actuaries and and uh, accountants, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the first thing that's involved is uh, is making commitment, a willingness to accept the costs of managing these risks. And uh, large organizations, large insurance companies, and banks they have chief risk officers that guide their programs. These are people usually with many years of experience and uh, knowledge of the industry, and and uh, uh, they usually build an organization within the organization around this risk management. Uh. Now, Standard and Poors, when they do uh, a credit rating of a company, they will examine their ent enterprise risk management practices in determining 
and that enters into determination of their credit uh, rating now. And the bank examiners uh, are very attentive to the, uh, they will evaluate the enterprise risk management systems that you have in place. So there are, you know, this is a really quite structured, quite institutionalized, let's say, and uh, the best large organizations do this in a very disciplined and structured way. You know, it, it sort of depends a lot on the industry. That's more likely to happen in unregulated industries, right? But if you're talking about, uh, let's say, the airline industry, you know, I think they'd be loath to, to make serious cuts in their safety procedures, right? Well, this is a part of their risk management, right? Um, it's hard for the banks to do this because they, they're subject to routine examinations. Examiners come in and they say, well, let me see how many people you have in this risk management. Let me see the minutes of these meetings. Let me see what you're doing here. So it's very hard to cut back there. Um, uh, you, you, don't, you don't want your credit rating reduced. You don't want to be criticized by the regulators. You don't want to, because they'd have real power to, to, to limit your activities. Um, and so uh, um, the, the inclination to stint is probably there, but, but not so much in highly regulated industries. I think in the banking in the banking area there there were um, before the crisis of 08 uh, there were practices that were uh, very questionable. Well, even now coming out, you you have these allegations about uh, uh, money laundering. That I mean, they're hard for me to understand. I, they really are difficult to understand. Um, but um, uh, since 08, the, the, bank, the bank examiners have, have, uh, and bank regulators have uh, gotten more religion. Uh, so they're a little bit tougher. Now maybe as this crisis fades into history, you know, they, they may become a little more relaxed and a little less uh, fastidious in this area.